How often do you worry about trifles? I'm sure that many people can worry about some trivial little thing and I belong to this type of people. The fact is that I noticed something strange in my wife's behavior and this marked the beginning of my investigation and the end result shocked me. I was furious. I found myself at a sophisticated gathering with my wife, Claire. It was one of those refined affairs where the conversation flows amongst the intellectual elite. I was content, savoring a fine scotch, untouched by mixers in my hand. While observing from a quiet corner, I noticed Claire engaged in lively discussion with her mentor and friend, Professor Randy Holcomb. Despite her gestures being somewhat restrained due to her martini clutching, it was evident she was endeavoring to convey a point to the professor. Personally, I held reservations about him, perceiving him as insincere and a bit of a womanizer. However, I refrained from expressing my personal disdain, knowing it would only lead to confrontation. Claire held him in high regard, viewing him through rose-tinted glasses. Claire harbored aspirations of becoming a best-selling author. Having already seen some success with a couple of published romance short stories that garnered positive reviews, she had devoted the past two years to meticulously researching the historical backdrop for her latest project, a romance novel. Her dedication extended to delving into the political, social, economic, and geographical aspects of the chosen era. Three months prior, she had embarked on the actual writing process as a full-time endeavor, and I had been steadfast in my support, both financially and emotionally. Claire anticipated having enough material ready to submit to a publisher for review within the next month. She continued her research on the book by regularly visiting the library and meeting with the professor each week. I wasn't thrilled about the time she spent away, especially with him, but I felt it was important to trust her without confrontation. My name is Jim Mitchell. I'm 36 years old and I work for a consulting engineering firm in the area. I'm not the most handsome guy. I have a receding hairline, but I stay in shape by working out and running regularly. I have a stable income and job security with my professional engineering license. Claire, who is 34, is tall, slender, and reasonably attractive, though not curvaceous. I thought her photo on the book's dust jacket would help its sales, but I might be biased. She possesses all the qualities I've always desired in a wife intelligence, confidence, and affection. However, our intimacy had dwindled lately, which I attributed to her long hours working on her novel. She had never offered it to me to read. Instead, she entrusted it to her mentor for feedback. As a professor of English literature, I assumed he was a better judge of its merit, but it still bothered me. Claire and I had discussed the idea of starting a family, and she had expressed her desire for children in the future. However, she wanted to establish herself as an author first, so I patiently awaited the completion of her novel. Nonetheless, as time passed without any sign of its completion, I began to have concerns. I hoped that once she finished the novel, she would be ready to start a family, considering her biological clock was ticking. Being only children ourselves, our parents were eager for grandchildren, and the delay made me worry that they might never experience that joy. Tonight's event was hosted by the Dean of the School of Arts, and I attended solely for Claire's sake. While I didn't particularly enjoy such gatherings, I supported her interests. My background in English literature was minimal, having prioritized pre-engineering subjects during college, resulting in a mediocre grade. Consequently, discussions revolving around the latest books and authors weren't exactly my cup of tea. Although I gleaned some knowledge from Claire, I felt out of place in such intellectual settings. When we first arrived, I joined Claire in greeting and shaking hands with most of the approximately 20 people present. As mentioned earlier, I now sat quietly in a corner with my scotch, observing the activity in the room. I took pleasure in seeing my wife among her colleagues, contemplating how wonderful it would be if her novel became a bestseller. Despite having only two modest books to her name, she engaged with the attendees as an almost equal. However, achieving bestseller status would elevate her far beyond them, allowing her to bask in their envy and jealousy. While not typically assertive, she, like anyone, craved recognition from her peers, which would greatly boost her confidence in herself and her abilities. I grinned to myself, pondering the extensive effort she had invested 
and the myriad possibilities that could unfold if her novel achieved widespread success. At that moment, I noticed movement in my peripheral vision and spotted Mrs. Holcomb, the professor's wife, heading my way. Internally, I sighed, as I had hoped to quietly sit without engaging with anyone, but it seemed that wasn't going to happen. Mrs. Holcomb, a motherly figure whom I'd exchanged brief words with on a few occasions but didn't know well, approached me. Jim, I see you sitting here alone and I couldn't let that stand. We can't have a man enjoying himself at these gatherings. It would tarnish their reputation, she quipped as she settled into a chair beside me. You've caught me, Mrs. Holcomb. Can I offer you a drink? Call me Jean, and I'll pass on the alcohol, but it seems you're enjoying yours. A bit of scotch keeps the pests away, Jean, that's what I always say. So, what are your thoughts on your wife's book? Randy thinks it's bound to be a bestseller. I suspect he's a tad envious. It hasn't been presented to me for perusal, so I can't speak to its literary merit or content. Well, I haven't read it either, but Randy seems impressed. Doesn't your wife discuss the book with you at all? Not a word. I'm starting to think she believes I wouldn't have anything valuable to say about it. Nonetheless, I'm immensely proud of her for taking on a novel, and from what you've shared, she seems to be excelling at it. Throughout that time, I observed Claire and the professor engaged in conversation across the room. Their discussion had persisted for quite a while. As I kept watching, it seemed they came to an understanding. Claire scanned the room, presumably searching for me, and upon spotting me, she began waving. However, her attention shifted when she noticed John beside me. With what seemed like a worried expression, she turned back to the professor and said something to him. They both glanced in our direction, looking perturbed, before hastening towards us without exchanging a word. As they approached, I pondered what could have alarmed them. Jean must have been observing them as well, as she remarked on their behavior. It seems our spouses are concerned about something we've done. It certainly seems that way, I quipped. Perhaps they think we're plotting an affair. Jean weakly smiled at my clumsy remark. Upon reaching us, our spouse is immediately engaged in a tense conversation. Hey, what are you two up to? Randy questioned. See, I told you. I chuckled to Jean. Told her what? Claire inquired. I told her I bet you two thought we were planning an affair. I grinned at them. Both Randy and my wife appeared to grow a shade paler, but Randy recovered first. Well, things seemed a bit suspicious over here, so we wanted to ensure you two were behaving yourselves, he chuckled wryly. Jean inquired, Have you resolved all the issues with Claire's book? It seemed like you were hashing it out thoroughly. Oh, absolutely, Randy replied. However, Claire's book doesn't have too many problems. She's on the right track with it, and it should receive a good response when it's published. But we've wrapped up discussing it for now. We exchanged nervous small talk for a few more minutes, and then the professor suggested to Jean, Why don't we mingle for a bit, my dear, and leave these two to themselves? I have a busy day ahead. As she stood up, Jean turned to me and said, Thanks for the conversation, Jim. We'll have to do it again sometime. Of course, Jean, it was a pleasure, I replied, turning to Claire, who remained quietly standing. Would you like to mingle as well, or are you ready to leave, Radin Yand? I asked. I think we can leave now. It's been a long day and I'm tired. I rose and after bidding farewell to our hosts, we made our way home. As I drove home, Claire remained silent, allowing me to ponder the reactions she and the professor displayed upon seeing Jean and me talking. Typically, I wouldn't have doubted Claire's trustworthiness, but a nagging feeling arose, prompting me to consider delving deeper into the matter with Jean. I resolved to pursue this conversation further in the upcoming week. On Wednesday morning, after tackling a slew of work issues, I finally managed to reach Jean and arrange a lunch appointment. She sensed something peculiar about our spouse's reactions to our recent encounter and promptly agreed to meet me the following day to discuss it. We chose O'Charlie's near the interstate, a location less likely for us to bump into our spouses or acquaintances. After having lunch, we delved into conversation. You must have had some worries to convene this meeting she remarked. I suppose I do, but I'm unsure of the next steps, I admitted. 
Well, I harbor concerns too, and they outweigh yours. That's why I consented to this meeting. She continued, A few years back, I discovered my husband having an affair with a graduate student. He promised it wouldn't happen again, but I suspect he'd been involved with other students prior to that, though I lacked evidence. This time, if he's involved with your wife, I'll make sure to gather proof and hold him accountable. I propose that we jointly hire a private investigator to cut down on costs. Investigator fees can be exorbitant, and by pooling our resources, we can ascertain whether there's any wrongdoing. Furthermore, I suggest we focus the investigation solely on my husband. If he's not involved with your wife or anyone else for that matter, I'll cover the expenses myself. However, if your wife is implicated, we split the costs. Does that seem equitable to you? I paused, considering her proposal. Sure, I agree. When would you like to proceed? Immediately. Are you available this afternoon at 3? I have an appointment with an investigator recommended by a friend who faced a similar issue. All right. Share the address and I'll meet you there. I should return to work now. That afternoon, at 3, we convened at the investigator's office, outlined our requirements, provided the necessary information about our partners, and Jean left a deposit to initiate the process. He assured us he would update Jean on a weekly basis unless immediate contact was necessary. Exiting his office, we both took a deep breath and sighed. We were committed, and now we had to wait. That would be the second most challenging aspect. The most difficult would be maintaining a facade of normalcy around our partners. The week passed slowly as I awaited word from Jean, understanding that it would likely be the entire week before we received any updates. I refrained from confronting Claire with my suspicions, trying to maintain normalcy. She behaved like her usual self, a loving wife, though our intimacy remained infrequent. When she initiated intimacy, I struggled to muster the passion and desire required. Finally, Jean called the following Wednesday, inviting me to the investigator's office for his initial report. Upon arrival, he motioned for us to sit and pulled a report from his desk. I understand you're eager for an update on Professor Holcomb's activities, and I regret to confirm your suspicions. Professor Holcomb is indeed having an affair with another woman. We trailed him to the Best Western Motel in Ginsburg on Thursday and again yesterday, where he met with a young woman. They entered different rooms each time, but it was the same woman on both occasions. I have photographs here of them entering and exiting the rooms. He passed the photos across his desk to us, and I picked one up with a trembling hand. As I examined it, I saw the professor emerging from a motel room behind a woman who glanced back at him. Though I couldn't see her face clearly, her height, hair color, and style resembled Claire's. Picking up another photo, the woman was facing the camera, and I realized she wasn't Claire but resembled a younger woman. With a sigh of relief, I reclined in my chair. I must have been incredibly tense because my body seemed to slump in relaxation, and my head drooped momentarily, releasing the anxiety I had been carrying for over a week. Raising my head, I observed Jean as she methodically sifted through the photos, her expression resolute and somber. Once she finished examining each one, she turned to the investigator. Can you obtain evidence of their activities in that room? Well, we could likely capture images, but they wouldn't hold up as evidence of adultery in court due to privacy concerns. However, if they engaged in such behavior in your home, those pictures could be admissible. Your husband might be aware of this and avoid bringing her there. I suggest consulting with a divorce attorney for guidance. I believe I'll do just that. Please continue surveillance until further notice, Jean stated, gathering the photos and preparing to depart. After leaving the investigator's office, we walked silently towards our cars for a couple of minutes. I'll be sending you a check to cover half of this week's surveillance, I informed her. You don't need to do that, she replied. I understand the distress of discovering your husband may have been unfaithful, but I found out he wasn't involved with my wife. That peace of mind is invaluable to me, and contributing towards the cost is the least I can do, so expect a check in the mail. Thank you very much, I'm grateful for your gesture. We said our goodbyes and I started driving home. It wasn't until a few minutes into the drive that a thought occurred to me. 
Why were the professor and Claire so unsettled at the gathering when Jean and I were conversing? The mystery remains unsolved, suggesting there's more to it. Perhaps Claire is involved with the professor and despite weeks of surveillance, they haven't been caught yet. I felt relieved that Jean had instructed the investigator to continue monitoring. I decided to call her and share my suspicions, ensuring the investigation wouldn't end abruptly without my knowledge. It struck me as odd that in all my discussions with Jean, we hadn't uncovered any clues hinting at a shared factor indicating Claire's indiscretions. Another week passed and once again we found ourselves in a meeting with the investigator. This time we were presented with essentially the same set of pictures featuring the same girl. The investigator had discovered she was another graduate student. Jean made the decision to proceed with a divorce citing irreconcilable differences as advised by her lawyer. Our state operated on a no-fault basis, meaning evidence of adultery wouldn't significantly affect the court's decision. Assets would be divided equally. Alimony would be paid since Jean didn't work, but child support wasn't necessary as their children were adults. I reimbursed Jean for half the surveillance costs and we parted ways. I still hadn't figured out why our spouses were so distressed at the gathering, but I was now convinced Claire wasn't involved with the professor. However, I was determined to uncover the truth. Hiring investigators was costly, so perhaps I should conduct my own surveillance. It was a decision I needed to ponder. Our intimate relationship had significantly decreased recently, and I pondered that if everything were normal, and I didn't suspect she was being unfaithful, I would have mentioned it to her. I opted to address the issue in a way that wouldn't raise suspicions of distrust but might provoke a guilty conscience if she harbored one. That night after dinner, I broached the subject of my concerns. Darling, is everything all right? You seem a bit off, I inquired. I'm fine. Why do you ask? She responded, a hint of annoyance creasing her brow. I've noticed you've been avoiding intimacy lately, and I was concerned it might be because you're not feeling well. Do you think you should see a doctor? Her complexion paled briefly, and I felt a twinge of satisfaction that my words were hitting home. No, I'm fine, really. I hadn't realized I was avoiding you. I'll make more of an effort, but I've been so focused on finishing the book to send to the publisher that I haven't had the mental space for much else lately. I understand, darling. You know how much I care about you and how proud I am of your work. I just worry. Plus, they say lovemaking can be a great stress reliever, and I'm always here to help you relax, I said with a grin. She smiled faintly in response and replied, Let's see and then she bent down to kiss me lightly on the lips. Taking my hand, she led me to our bedroom. It seemed unreal. My desire was obvious, but I felt her lack of genuine enthusiasm when we made love. It seemed like she was just pretending to calm me down, or rather, to calm my inner turmoil. She showed all the expected reactions, but afterwards I didn't feel that it was all sincere. It left a void in my chest. After she got free, she excused herself and went to the bathroom, then returned, muttering, Good night, darling, and lay down, turning her back to me. The following morning, I departed for work at my usual time while Claire remained in bed. Once I was away from home, I pulled over, dialed my office from my cell phone to inform them of my absence for the day, and then made my way to a nearby car rental agency. Typically, this was the day Claire dedicated to her research at the library. After acquiring a rental vehicle, I returned to our street and parked at a vantage point where I could observe our house from a distance. Around nine o'clock, I observed Claire exiting the garage and driving away from me towards the university library. I discreetly followed her at a safe distance. She drove directly to the library, and as I was parking, she had already left her car and entered the building. I followed a few minutes later, knowing where she typically did her research. I found her setting up for a review of some microfiche material. Concealed behind a nearby stack, I observed her while pretending to be engrossed in a large reference book. Half an hour later, Claire was joined by another woman. When Claire spotted her, they embraced, lightly kissing each other on the lips in greeting, which surprised me. Despite my confusion, I continued to watch. Claire returned to her seat at the microfiche machine while the other woman retrieved a book from her bag and began reading as if she were simply passing the time. Claire continued working for another hour before displaying signs of wrapping up for the day, 
gathering her notes and personal items. I had to briefly step away to use the restroom, worried they might leave in my absence. But timing worked out, and I didn't miss anything. As Claire prepared to leave, another woman was also getting ready to depart. They exchanged another kiss before leaving the building hand in hand. Upon reaching the parking lot, they went their separate ways to their respective cars. I hung back in the lot until they started moving, then discreetly followed as they both headed in a direction opposite to our home. They didn't seem to notice me as I maintained a respectful distance behind. With light traffic and few stoplights, we continued in a direction away from our home. Approximately 20 minutes later, they arrived at an apartment complex and parked. After exiting their cars, they entered one of the buildings and I settled in to wait. About two hours later, I observed Claire exiting the apartment, returning to her car and departing the parking lot. I trailed her until I was certain she was headed home. Then I went to grab a bite to eat and ponder over what I had witnessed. What was happening? Who was that woman? Did you have an unconventional affair with her? Ultimately, how could I obtain answers to my inquiries? My thoughts were somewhat muddled as I dined, but it boiled down to this. Should I enlist the services of an investigator or tackle it myself? Eventually, I resolved to gather information on my own. After finishing my meal, I ventured to a nearby radio shack and purchased three battery-operated, sound-activated micro-audio recorders. They were somewhat pricey, but I deemed them more economical than hiring an investigator. By the time I completed my purchases, it was nearing my usual time to return home from work, so I made my way to the rental car lot and retrieved my own vehicle. Upon arriving home, Claire greeted me with what appeared to be an affectionate kiss and embrace. Sweetheart, freshen up and fix yourself a drink. Dinner will be ready in approximately 30 minutes, she instructed as she retreated back into the kitchen. After preparing my drink, I made my way into the kitchen. How was your day? I inquired. It was all right. I spent the morning at the library getting some work done, and in the afternoon I worked on the book. Just the usual, I suppose, she replied. Any news from anyone? Did your mother mention anything about visiting? No, it was a quiet day. I didn't speak to anyone, she responded. If I didn't know any better, I would have unquestioningly believed what she told me. She spoke without hesitation, weaving her lies seamlessly. Once I would have trusted her with my life, but now that trust hangs in the balance. It feels like our entire marriage is built on deception and the possibility of infidelity, even if it's with another woman. I returned to the living room before saying anything, wanting to have all the facts straight before confronting her. How was your day? she asked as she entered the living room. Just the usual. I spent most of the day out of the office working on a project, I replied, mentioning it in case she had tried to reach me there. Dinner is ready now if you'd like to sit down. While we were having dinner, she mentioned that she had a meeting scheduled with Professor Holcomb in his office the following day to discuss the latest chapter of her book. She expressed her excitement about almost completing the package for the publisher. I nodded in response and wished her luck. After dinner, I cleaned up the kitchen while she retreated to her study to continue working on her book. Once I finished, I discreetly placed one of the mini audio recorders under the driver's seat of her car in the garage, ensuring it was well hidden but easily accessible. Then I placed another recorder in the lining of her purse. I held on to the third recorder to potentially install it in her study, if she made any calls from there. I relaxed and watched TV until around 10 o'clock, then knocked on the door of her study. Darling, I'm heading to bed to do some reading. Will you join me soon? I want to wrap up this chapter so I have it ready for Professor Holcomb tomorrow, so I might be a while. I'll come to bed as soon as I can. All right, I replied and went to bed. I read for a bit but soon dozed off into sleep. I'm not sure when she joined me in bed, as I was fast asleep. The following morning as I left for work, she remained sound asleep. I decided to rely on the recorders for surveillance, sparing myself from interrupting my work. Upon returning home that evening, I waited until after dinner and until she retreated to her den before heading to the garage to inspect the recorder in her car. As expected, it captured little in terms of conversation. 
I then located her purse and discreetly examined the recorder hidden inside, using earphones. Once more, the recordings yielded nothing substantial beyond her discussion with Professor Holcomb about her book. There appeared to be no indication of any other topics between them. After resetting and replacing it, I resigned to wait for an opportunity to check the recorder in her den. The evening unfolded much like the previous one, concluding with me retiring to bed alone. The next morning I woke up early and quietly entered her sanctuary to retrieve the final recorder. This one captured a brief yet intriguing one-sided conversation. Initially, I heard the sound of dialing, indicating Claire was making a call. Hey, it's me, my wife's voice came through. Are we still on for tomorrow? The voice on the other end was faint, likely belonging to another woman. Yes, I'm looking forward to it as well, but I'm starting to worry. Jim's been acting strangely. I'm beginning to think he might suspect something. No, I'm not ready to leave him yet, despite your offer. I need to finalize this section of the book with a publisher and secure their commitment before making any decisions. I still need his support for a little longer. I can't wait until we can be together all the time. These brief encounters twice a week barely suffice. Seeing you tomorrow for a few hours will be a relief. It's been difficult pretending with Jim just to keep him content a little longer. I don't derive the same satisfaction from it as I do from being with you. All right, I love you too. See you tomorrow at the library. I was shocked. Everything she was doing and her plans were laid out before me. I had believed I loved her and that she loved me in return. Now it seems she's just using me for food, clothes, and shelter while she writes her book and starts an unconventional romance. Despite all the years we've been married, I realize how little I truly knew her. Hastily, I reset the recorder, concealed it again, and then left for work, deeply shaken by the revelations of her betrayal. At work, I was mentally clouded for about an hour before deciding I needed impartial advice on how to proceed with my marriage. It was evident that divorce was inevitable, but I wanted to safeguard myself financially before proceeding. A friend who had recently gone through a difficult divorce recommended a divorce lawyer, so I call it and schedule it an appointment for the following morning. I intended to listen to the recordings again to gather more evidence to present to the lawyer. That night I discovered that the recording device from her purse was the main catalyst for our divorce. The tape started playing for a short time, apparently in the library. Okay, I'm almost done. I just need to finish and we can go to your place. God, I want you so much. Claire's voice rang out. Another female voice answered, Let's hurry up, it's late and you want to get home on time. There was silence until the recording resumed, probably in another woman's apartment. There were sounds that helped me make sure that my wife was really cheating on me. It continued like this for some time, then ceased as they clearly began to dress, followed by silence. Sensing I had gathered sufficient information, I decided against rehiding the recorders. Instead, I duplicated the pertinent content three times. Two sets were concealed in my briefcase, and the third was prepared for delivery to the lawyer. I retired to bed without informing Claire, a departure from my usual routine that might signal an issue to her, but I no longer cared. I planned to wait until I spoke with the lawyer the next day before confronting Claire. Sleep eluded me initially, and lying there I pondered how Jean Holcomb was progressing with her divorce. The incident at the soiree had certainly been revealing, yet I remained perplexed as to why an affair between Claire and the professor had not been uncovered. I drifted off to sleep again before Claire returned to bed. The following morning I arrived at work and after a discussion with my boss, headed to the lawyer's office. Upon arrival, his secretary promptly escorted me to his office, where I spent around 15 minutes explaining the situation regarding my wife. I also played him recordings of her conversations with her lover. When I finished, he posed a couple of questions. Do you have any idea if the book your wife has been working on will be successful? I haven't read it myself, but my wife has been collaborating with Professor Holcomb from the university's English department and I've heard he's quite enthusiastic about it. She's currently sending off some early chapters and a story outline to a publisher, so I suppose that will give her an indication of its potential success. Have you been her primary source of financial support while she's been working on it? Yes, a couple of years ago she quit a good job to focus full-time on her book, 
and I've been providing all of her financial and emotional support since then. What are your intentions? Are you aiming for a divorce, separation, or do you see the possibility of reconciliation after counseling? I'm pursuing a divorce, and I want to make it as challenging as possible for her, especially after hearing what she said to her lover. I've considered destroying her book by deleting her PC files and all her research notes. I advise against that. While it might give you satisfaction in the moment, you could be missing out on a chance for greater revenge. What do you mean? I inquired. If the book has a good chance of selling well, even becoming a bestseller, you could potentially claim half of her earnings from its well in the divorce. That would be a significant revenge and could be highly lucrative for you. If you destroy her work now, she could easily replace it in a few months, and you'd gain nothing from it. That's something to consider, though perhaps not as immediately gratifying for revenge. Well, you need to consider that this could potentially be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to you. Meanwhile, she might regain her footing in the novel within six months, leaving you with minimal benefit. What's your suggestion? I advise waiting to gauge the response to her book from the publisher. If she secures an advance, it signals significant potential. A substantial advance might prompt her to move in with her partner promptly. At that point, you can proceed with the divorce proceedings. Since this is a no-fault state, we'll cite irreconcilable differences and seek a share of the book's proceeds. Adultery could be cited, but it's unlikely to impact the outcome and could be costlier. If the book generates income, you might not have to pay alimony. Also, her previous well-paying job before she quit to focus on her book will work in your fur regarding alimony. It seems I have a lot to consider. Can I take a day to think it over and get back to you? Of course, just give me a call when you're ready. After leaving the lawyer's office, I returned to work, but my productivity was limited for the remainder of the day as I mulled over my options. I harbored a strong desire to retaliate against her for exploiting me, but I also hesitated to jeopardize my potential financial stake in her book sales. Then, a thought struck me about Claire's conservative Christian parents. Their disapproval of their daughter's unconventional relationships and adultery could potentially be used for revenge. As this notion took shape in my mind, I stopped by Radio Shack on my way home from work to acquire another surveillance device. Claire and I enjoyed the dinner she had prepared when we got back home. During our meal, she mentioned that she would be sending off a package to the publisher the next day, anticipating a response in about a month. She also shared gossip about Professor Holcomb's marital issues, as his wife was reportedly divorcing him after catching him with another woman, which was expected to be financially draining for him. I couldn't help but smile at Claire's reaction to my comment, indicating she wasn't pleased. That's the consequence of fooling around. If it were me, I'd want some retribution, I remarked. Her expression grew tense, but she quickly composed herself. Why do you assume it could happen to you? Do you think I'm capable of such behavior? She asked boldly. Sweetheart, I understand you're as loyal as any spouse can be. But the thought of infidelity between partners really bothers me and gets me worked up. I trust you completely and I know you'd never betray me just as I would never betray you. She promptly shifted the topic. Remember, it's garbage night and there are a few bags of items in the garage that need sorting for recycling. Got it, I'll handle it. Then she retreated to her study and I didn't see her for the rest of the night. While she was occupied in her study, I set up a motion-activated mini-camera and a high-capacity recorder that I had purchased earlier that day at Radio Shack in our bedroom. I integrated it with the house wiring to avoid the hassle of battery changes. Additionally, it was equipped with audio capabilities. After confirming its functionality, I kept it switched off until I could execute the next phase of my plan. The next morning I left before she woke up and grabbed breakfast at Denny's. Once at work, I phoned the lawyer, instructing him to postpone the divorce proceedings until we learned the fate of the book's publication. He acknowledged the wisdom in my decision. In the evening, I informed Claire that I had a three-day business trip scheduled for the following week. Later, while reviewing voice recordings, I overheard Claire discussing my trip with her lover, Eileen Carter. A divorcee, as I had discovered. Claire proposed that Eileen stay over at our house for the duration of my absence so they could spend time together while Claire worked on her book. 
Eileen agreed, and thus the second part of my plan fell neatly into place. The next week I packed my bags and headed out for a business trip, though it was merely a short drive to a town 40 miles away. I stayed in a motel with a decent restaurant. Prior to my departure, I had a discussion with both my boss and secretary, informing them that I would be away for a few days and if my wife called, they were to inform her that I was out of town. They seemed to sense that something was amiss in my marriage, but agreed to play along. Each night, I made sure to call Claire on my cell phone to prevent her from growing suspicious. I mostly stayed close to my hotel room, avoiding any chance encounters with acquaintances. The three days were rather dull. When the three days were up, I returned home and acted as if I had just returned from a trip across the country. Claire was at home, ready with dinner upon my arrival. After a casual greeting from her, I inquired about her book. Have you received any updates about your book? Not yet, it's still too early. They've only just received it. I anticipate it will be another two to four weeks before I receive any feedback. Are you feeling excited? Absolutely. I can hardly sleep at night wondering how it will be received. I've been trying to reach Professor Holcomb, but he's not taking any calls. I wanted to discuss some questions I have with him, but I suppose he must be preoccupied with his wife and the university. What's going on at the university with him? I inquired. I heard it's because he was involved with another woman who was an undergraduate, and the university has strict policies against staff fraternizing with undergraduates. He might end up getting fired, and I'd hate to see that happen. I expressed to her, he deserves whatever consequences come his way. Isn't that a bit harsh? She queried, her lips forming a pout. I've made my stance clear on infidelity. There's no leniency in me when it comes to cheating, I stated firmly, locking eyes with her. She appeared slightly unsettled, but pressed on nonetheless. Well, if one partner fails to meet the other's needs, I believe they should have the freedom to seek fulfillment elsewhere. Do you genuinely believe that? What about the vows of marriage, promising exclusivity? What about discussing issues with the partner before seeking solace elsewhere? What about counseling as a first step before seeking comfort in another? I challenged. And while we're on the topic, can you honestly say if I'm meeting your needs? She hesitated before responding, her expression tinged with sadness. Jim, you satisfy me in ways no other man could. Following that, she entered her study and closed the door behind her. I refrained from pressing the matter further, knowing I wasn't prepared to address it yet. I stayed silent. Whether my words had any impact on her, I couldn't tell. At that moment, I felt it wouldn't make any difference anyhow. I reviewed the footage from the mini-camera recorder and indeed, I had captured them in our bed as I had anticipated. The conversation mirrored previous ones I had overheard, so now I could simply observe and wait. Over the next three weeks, we were in a state of anticipation. Everything hung in limbo as we awaited news about the book. We seemed to coexist, each occupied with our own pursuits. Though we had intimacy a couple of times, it felt perfunctory, and the pressure made it difficult to perform. Then, one day after work, I returned home to find Claire brimming with excitement. Guess what? The publishers called today. They really liked my book and they're sending me an advance of $25,000. I'm thrilled. They also suggested I find an agent and provided a couple of recommendations. I've spent the whole afternoon on the phone with them and I think I've found one I like. That's fantastic, honey. I'm genuinely happy for you. You've put in so much effort and you deserve recognition. How about we go out for dinner tonight to celebrate? I was thinking the same thing. Let me go change. We dined at one of the finest restaurants in town before returning home and being intimate. She appeared more enthusiastic than usual, and I felt pleasantly drained as we cuddled and drifted off to sleep together. My final thought before sleep was to contact the lawyer in the morning and initiate the divorce proceedings. Once she received that advance check, I knew my time with her was coming to an end. The following day while at work, I phoned the attorney who assured me he'd prepare the documents that day and submit them the next. The serving process would take place the day after. Prior to departing home that morning, I made copies of several DVDs featuring Claire and her paramour in our bed and forwarded one to the lawyer. I intended to hold off on taking further action with the remaining DVDs for a while. 
A few days later, I took a day off to handle the necessary adjustments to our joint bank accounts, credit cards, finances, insurance, retirement plans, and my will. Claire was still asleep after staying up late working on her book when I left the house. She was expected to be home all day and would be served with the papers sometime in the morning. The documents were for a divorce, citing irreconcilable differences and proposing a 50-50 division of all assets, including future earnings from her book. At my request, the packet of papers included a photo taken from a DVD showing her in bed with her lover. I wanted her to comprehend the reasons behind my decision to pursue a divorce when she received it. Around 11 twi I received a call from her. She sounded remarkably composed. It seems you've uncovered my secret. Jim, your package has a reved, and I regret that our marriage must conclude in this manner. I intend to seek legal counsel and contest your claim to a portion of my book. By the time you return from work, I'll have relocated. My attorney assures me that I have a strong case for retaining full rights to the book, but you're welcome to discuss it with your own legal representation. Farewell, Claire. It appears all future communication should be through our lawyers. I wish you well. I ended the call before she could reply. There was one final task on my agenda, to be completed after the divorce proceedings, sending a copy of the DVD to her parents. It was a small act of revenge, in addition to any financial compensation I hoped to gain from her book. It took approximately six months for the divorce proceedings to be completed. There were extensive negotiations between our respective attorneys, but ultimately, I secured 40% of her book royalties due to my financial and supportive contributions throughout her research and writing process. Eventually, I received over a quarter of a million dollars from my share as the book skyrocketed to the bestseller list and remained a top seller for a month. Professor Holcomb faced a significant setback in his divorce settlement, leading to his resignation despite his tenured position. The university threatened to publicly expose his indiscretions if he didn't comply, and he reluctantly agreed to resign. A year post-divorce, while dining alone at a local restaurant, he heard a familiar voice approach him, asking, Mind if I join you? I glanced up to find Claire standing before me, her gaze expectant. She appeared quite appealing and impeccably dressed, much like one would envision a best-selling artist. Rising to my feet, I gestured for her to take a seat. How have you been, Claire? It's been a while and you look wonderful. I've been doing well. Currently engrossed in a new novel, she replied, a smirk playing on her lips. And this time, I don't plan on sharing any of it with you. Chuckling, I replied, I have no doubt it'll be a tremendous success. It was amusing how comfortable I felt around my ex-wife now that the emotional turbulence of our divorce was behind us. So, how about you? Any new romantic interests in your life? I inquired. She hesitated slightly at my question, but maintained a smile. No, just the occasional date, nothing serious. I'm not eager to dive back into the fray. And you? I noticed a hint of unease in her expression at my response, but she carried on with a grin. I'm flying solo like you. No romantic entanglements. What happened with Eileen? I thought she and your interest in girls were a good deal for you. She appeared somewhat hesitant to respond to me, but after a pause, she admitted something to me. My relationship with Eileen only lasted a few months and the initial excitement wore off, leading to our breakup. I haven't been with another woman since. Looking back, I realize what I lost when we split, and I deeply regret the whole situation. I've had my own regrets too, but trust is easily lost and difficult to regain. I suppose I'm still upset with you for sending that DVD to my parents. It took them a while to start talking to me again. I guess I wanted some payback for how you were treating me. I've often wondered, she said, how did you find out about my involvement with Eileen? It's bothered me because I tried to keep it from you until after the book was published. I took a moment to reminisce about the instance when I initially sensed something amiss, and even now, I remained perplexed by it as I replied. Do you recall that gathering at the Dean's residence? I believe it occurred during the Christmas break a couple of years back. 
Yes, I remember, but I can't recollect doing anything there related to Eileen. I then proceeded to share my suspicions about the professor's philandering tendencies, recounting my conversation with Jean, the professor's wife, and their reaction upon seeing us together. Their response, combined with Jean's prior discovery of the professor's infidelity, fueled our suspicion that there was more than just academic mentoring involved in their reaction to our interaction. We had speculated that there might have been some ulterior motive for discouraging our conversation. Claire looked shocked before replying. As I remember, our reaction stemmed from Randy and I having a conversation for a while, causing us to overlook both of you. Suddenly, we felt guilty about neglecting you. There was no collusion between us, nor were we concerned about your conversation. Anyway, I explained to her, due to our misunderstanding of that reaction, we decided to hire an investigator who uncovered the professor's affair with the student, but never found any evidence of your involvement with him. Later, still suspicious, I discreetly placed some mini audio recorders and captured your affair with Eileen. Thus, it was your and the professor's innocent reaction upon seeing Jean and me talking together that led to the exposure of two affairs and the end of two marriages. Quite peculiar, isn't it?